Our next speaker is a beautiful lady. Uh, Karen Omri, Assistant Professor of American Studies at the Department of English, Language and Literature at the University of Haifa. Her book, Cross Rhythms, Jazz Aesthetics in African American Literature, was published with Continuum in 2008, and she has since continued to publish on music and literature. In addition, she works on the contemporary teaching and writing on science fiction, hip-hop aesthetics, James Bond, and other dimensions of popular culture. Her talk today is Jazz in African American Literature. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am going to try and do this while I um, start the talk. No. Um, so um, it's, it's quite a delight to be here and it's quite a delight to follow um, the previous speaker because um, a lot of uh, really relevant points were raised in the talk that um, I will touch on in very different ways, um, particularly the, the Kamasi Washington uh, video that, that, um, you, that we just saw, I think, is a really nice segue into some of the things that I want to talk about. Um, if you remember, he said... Um, uh, the music of 1992 is about 1992. The music of 1965 is about 1965. And of course, it's not only that, is it? And the, the way that that concert was effective and the way that jazz is effective, the way this all works is that everything echoes with earlier forms, right? This is how we recognize and enjoy jazz because we, we, we hear the quotations and we hear the frameworks. And a lot of the, com the, the comments that were made... Um, about what jazz is, which in itself is interesting because it's not really singular, is it? Jazzes are. Um, I, I, a lot of the comments presume that um, we know what jazz is and what jazz does, and the way that we do know what jazz is and does is that it has a symbolic resonance, right? It, it has, it performs um, an aesthetic and a political function. Um, what I want to do today is talk about another symbolic function that jazz has, and that is one that functions in literature. It's a very interesting um, context for me to be in. I'm usually talking to a lot of literature people who know very little about jazz, and now I'm talking to a lot of literature, a lot of jazz people who um, may or may not know the novels I want to talk about. I just need to find my um, PowerPoint, and um, we can begin. Um, okay. And um, as I was um, preparing for today, I was debating whether um, I should give sort of a broad survey about uh, kind of the larger aspects of my, my projects, which is how um, African-American writers and writers in general in the United States write about jazz forms, or whether I should give some more particular examples to show some of those complexities. And I've, I've decided to go with the latter. Um, and what I want to do, this is in my way, I can't see. What I want to do um, today is to show how two different writers, um, one from the 60s, James Baldwin, uh, in a novel called uh, Another Country, 1962, 1962, and Toni Morrison, 30 years later, in a novel called Jazz, um, use uh, models of uh, jazz in general and bebop in particular to think about the politics of jazz, to talk about blackness. Now, um, I, pres I assume I don't need to introduce bebop to, to this audience, but I will give you a sense of what I mean when I say bebop. I'm talking about um, a music that gains momentum in the 1940s. It's a music that symbolizes the shift that jazz takes from popular forms of swing and, and blues and, and, and ragtime to a music for musicians and intellectual exploration into harmonies. Um, it was also... Um, um, kind of, uh, here I have it, images, um, a, a very performative kind of musical moment. They, they all had the outfits and the glasses. It had to do with a certain um, political attempt to reclaim jazz for black communities and for political purposes. Um, Paul Gilroy, uh, the sociologist, describes blackness as a metaphysical condition that creates as much as it is created by the social surroundings rather than any fixed and static identity. And so when we say what is blackness, um, what uh, the moment of bebop does, what the writers I'm looking at have attempted to represent is how blackness is not a static um, identity inherited biologically or um, 
politically, but how it is performed, it is dynamic, and it is infinite. Um, now, what emerges in these two novels is a new formulation of blackness that incorporates communal consent and self-conscious choice as defining features. Um, again, uh, an emphasis on choice, on performance, on um, dynamic interaction, communal definitions, rather than an inherited or static identity. Um, now, this notion of performance from vaudeville and minstrel shows through to bebop, which um, relies so heavily on quotation, imitation, parody, mimicry, not to mention the fine-tuned performance of, of the zoot suits, right? They, they were all very kind of well aware of themselves as performers. Um, we can see how imitation, how acting out can carry crucial social implications as well as biting critique. Another country, um, just a show of hands, has anyone read Another Country? 1962 novel by James Baldwin. Um, it's, it's a novel that is constructed across racial binaries. Uh, we, there are white characters, there are black characters. Um, the main protagonist of the first section of the novel, is his name is Rufus, he's a black uh, bebop drummer. Um, and uh, he, we follow him through uh, the streets of New York uh, where he's literally down and out. Uh, he's recollecting and, and kind of rehearsing the, the, the difficulties of, of black existence um, until he finally kills himself. So he becomes completely overcome um, uh, by the hardships of the experience of a black man uh, in, the, in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, throughout this novel, the characters are constantly confronted by masks of race um, and, and that creates a kind of hostility um, and conflict within themselves and in their relationships to other characters. Um, a lot of the, the, the interesting moments in the novel happens um, in the meeting of mixed race couples and over the sites of jazz. So you have jazz musicians, jazz clubs, um, all kinds of uh, musical moments and that is when we really see the conflict of uh, the rigidity of racial expectations um, one vis-a-vis -vis the other, black versus white. Now, where Baldwin focuses on this interaction between black and white, Toni Morrison, writing nearly 30 years later, seems to exclude white Ameri Americans from the space of her book, Jazz, um, almost entirely, except to preserve their role as some kind of um, uh, uh, demeaning and uh, limiting um, context. So, in the, has anyone read Jazz, the novel? Okay, um, so um, within this novel, we have uh, nearly no white characters. Um, they are at the backdrop of, of the city, which is very much um, a black populated city. Um, and what Morrison is really interested in is not so much black versus white as these kind of very static identities, but the complexities within, within blackness. Um, black, like jazz, is no longer any one thing, it's not a clear thing, it's not a, a, a definable thing, but it's a multiplicity of, of things and of performances. Now, in another country, Rufus, the, um, the uh, jazz protagonist, um, uh, and, and uh, the many other characters, I have, their names Vivaldo and Ida and so on, they're, they're struggling with their masks of race. In jazz, the characters are faced with their own multiple self-identities which reflect against one another. So um, s almost every one of the, the main characters in, in Morrison's novel um, sort of um, dissolves into um, a multiplicity of, of interacting identities. Uh, the central characters in jazz are each described in terms of their many selves, each one watching the performance of the other. So just to give you an out, a plot outline of, of the novel Jazz, this is no spoiler, it's on the first page. Um, it's a classic blues, um, my lover done left me, and, and so on, uh, uh, storyline. So we have Joe and Violet, a middle-aged married couple. Um, Joe um, starts having an affair with a young girl, Dorcas. All uh, these characters are African-American. Dorcas decides to uh, leave Joe, uh, and so he, uh, he loves her so much, he kills her. Um, and Violet, the, the wife, uh, basically loses her mind and goes to Dorcas's funeral with a knife um, attempting to deface the body, um, particularly the face. It is the face of this young girl she feels is, is kind of taken, taken Joe away. 
Um, in one scene, Violet, called violent by some after her disruption of the funeral, she sits in the drugstore, um, and I'm quoting, sucking malt through a straw, wondering who on earth that other Violet was that walked about the city in her skin, peeped out through her eyes and saw other things. As she tries to explain to Felice, another, another young girl, about having another you inside that isn't anything like you, Felice asks, how did you get rid of her? I killed her. Then I killed the me that killed her. Who's left? Me. So we don't have this kind of self-effacing conflict of identity that eventually overpowers Rufus, the, the James Baldwin uh, jazz drummer in the earlier text, but a living, breathing, acting character that inhabits the same body. And because of this perceived inner division, poses a violent threat. Now, this division inevitably results in destruction in the novel, highlighting the dangers of this concept of a cast of roles enacted on the stage of a character, which stands in contrast to some essential core. So just to link this to the ideas of, of, of bebop a bit more, more clearly, perhaps, um, and the, the ideas of race, rather than having a um, kind of a singular and coherent entity, what Morrison is demonstrating is that each character dissolves into a, a, a destru potentially destructive uh, set of characters um, playing, played out on the site of the body. Um, and until th that multiplicity is resolved, just like within Bebop, until the harmonies, the, new co the complexity of the harmonic improvisations within Bebop are somehow resolved, we won't have a coherent um, production, whether that production is a, is a social being or it is a musical piece. Joe, uh, Violet's husband, who's seeking to escape his own self-destructive spiraling identity, explains the power of Dorcas's face over him as she describes her bad skin. So Joe meets Dorcas, he's a traveling salesman, he sells cosmetics um, to black women who want to lighten their skin and straighten their hair and kind of do away with their signs of blackness. And he says the following, he says, um, her bad skin had little half moons clustered underneath her cheek, she had acne, right, she had very bad skin, um, little half moons clustered underneath her cheekbones like faint hoof marks. I bought the stuff she told me to, but glad none of it ever worked. Take my little hoof marks away, leave me with no tracks at all. It is these tracks which take hold of him as he hunts her down. Dorcas's face becomes more than the mask which pulls Joe in and pulls Violet apart, splitting her into those two and many more Violets, or a visage which, with the props of skin bleach, curling iron, cosmetics, tonics, represents a stage for some masquerade in which Dorcas becomes the prey, Joe the hunter, and Violet turns wild. Instead, through Morrison's language, the tracks in her skin become mingled with the tracks of music. That saturates the narrative. And here's another Quotation, Joe is bound to the track. It pulls him like a needle through the groove of a bluebird record, round and round about the town. That's the way the city spins you. So the, the link of, of her, bod, her black body um, to uh, the music and to, to the way the characters are attracted to one another uh, becomes explicitly linked to the music. By aligning Joe's response to Dorcas with a musical experience that emanates from and encompasses the city itself, Morrison introduces a redeeming link between the individual and the community. Throughout both of these texts and throughout bebop, I think in particular, jazz in general, but bebop in particular, we have a redefinition of the role of the individual in the community. The characters cease being puppeteered by an alienating force which directs the roles that they act out. Um, now, uh, like the, like the parallel potential for divisiveness of a music which emphasizes solo improvisation, Morrison offers the model of unity in which the divisive forces are not homogenized but reconciled. And this is an important point. And um, both within the music and in the novel, we don't have a sense of a flattening out of the differences, but what we have is a new way of harmonizing between them, a new reconciliation. And it is this kind of reconciliation that the characters in the Baldwin, the earlier text, are really struggling to achieve across the boundary of race within the mixed couple. Um, a, a, a rather long quotation. Um, uh, this is a scene in which Vivaldo, Vivaldo is uh, an Italian-American character who in the novel is by everyone else is perceived as simply 
white, but in terms of his own experience, he is, of course, less than white because he's Italian-American in the 1950s. Um, that, that's a significant minority position in the city. Um, and he suddenly realizes that the categories of race, the categories of people, uh, have uh, no longer hold any truth, and they've become a system of empty signs. And when he realizes he's te temporarily paralyzed, something in him was breaking. He was briefly and horribly in a region where there was no definitions of any kind, neither of color nor of male and female. Right? We heard before about how bebop and later free jazz br start breaking the rules, and, and here we see something similar going on to the language of race. There was only the leap and the rending and the terror and the surrender and the terror, which all seemed to begin and end and begin again forever in a cavern behind the eye, right? The way we see the world. Order, order, set thine house in order. When people no longer knew that a mystery could only be approached through form, people became what the people of this time and place had become, what he had become. They perished within their despised clay tenements in isolation, passively or actively together in mobs, thirsting and seeking for an eventually reeking of blood. So there, there's um, a very kind of devastating, very violent um, danger lurking uh, once this system of symbols evaporates. This terrifying realm of no definitions is the birth pangs of an America that accepts the blood ties between black and white citizens. And this is exactly what is happening in the United States in the 1940s, right? At the end of the Second World War, um, the soldiers coming home, there's a rise in racial violence. It's no accident that bebop comes out in this time. Not because it's inherently political, necessarily, but because it reflects a time in which um, innovation was needed, both aesthetically um, and politically. The distinctions so long adamantly preserved are beginning to crumble, revealing the terror and the surrender which had created them. Vivaldo must re-see things, he must re-learn his surroundings and how to interact without succumbing to chaos. And significantly, he must first make the choice to do this, right? So choice becomes a very important um, um, strategy in the United States for, um, for individuals. Um, the prevalent theme of sight, how we see, what we know, the recognition of ignorance, and the desire to recti rectify ignorance is closely associated with sexuality in another country. Um, and there's a series of images, which, which I, I won't go into now, but um, they all relate to the a biblical trope of the Garden of Eden. Okay, so knowledge, sex, um, innocence, experience, death, and, all, and, and good and evil, and so on. Um, this, this link, um, is, is re readopted and, and, and kind of rewritten uh, later on in in the Morrison novel. Um, there's a, where there's a parallel stress on behavior which strives towards knowledge, um, w uh, and, and where, where kind of the, the inherited categories are are, are brought to bear. Um, I've been told I have five minutes, so I'm going to skip uh, one more example, and I'm going to uh, reach the conclusion. Um, so um, just to say that both in Another Country and in uh, the Morrison text, we see both of these writers referring to the Garden of Eden as a way of um, re rebooting, to use a contemporary word, rebooting um, the, the categories of race and the potential that literature and music has to, to, to give new meaning to these categories. In his 1968 article, uh, Leroy Jones, Amiri Baraka, who just recently died, uh, he's a um, journalist, sociologist, uh, writer, um, a reviewer, and so on. He writes uh, about the new music, which is emerging in, in the late 60s, this avant-garde that we heard a bit about, John Coltrane, Albert Eiler, Coleman, uh, Sun Ra, and others. And he argues that through the new black music, the musicians and the audience are transported to another place, a place where black people live. And so Jones identifies jazz as a physical space, a region inhabited by African Americans not unlike the uniquely black space of the city depicted in Morrison's novel. Now Jones makes a direct link between the developments of bebop and the explorations of free jazz, suggesting that they are intimately linked in the process of self-knowledge. Um, he says, that's what it's about, consciousness. What are you with, right? The word consciousness, the word con, with, and, and just 
uh, is, is kind of a, a root of, of knowledge. The new musicians are self-conscious, just as the boppers were. In other words, Jones envisages a new space created through music in which African Americans know themselves. As she lies dying, Dorcas, the character from the Morrison novel, recognizes the possibilities of their love, hers and Joe. She refuses to give up Joe to the police as she's dying in her own pool of blood. Um, and she sends Joe the message that there's only one apple, referring back to the, the, the garden image. There's only one apple. Refusing to betray her lover, even though she is shot by him, Dorcas's message suggests her recognition that love is the key. Recalling a passage in the Jones article, Changing Same, what is the object of John Coltrane's love? There is none. It is for the sake of loving, Train speaks of. As Roz, when angels speak of love, the change to love, the freedom to and of love. And it, in this constant evocation of love, its need, its demands, its birth, its death. There is a morality that shapes such a sensibility and a sensibility shaped by such moralizing. In other words, and this is my, my final sentence, in other words, through love, through constructive relationships with others, which concentrate on a unified sensibility of self, rather than on the alienating roles stipulated by racializing social and cultural history, a new musical and moral aesthetic emerges which lays the foundation for a new community. Baldwin's haunted saxophone player pleads with his audience, do you love me? And Morrison moves from her novel Jazz through Paradise to finally, ultimately, answer with Love, which are titles of her later works. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, I, I, I first heard uh, Omri in a lecture, I think it was on the Technion, uh, which, which really blew me because I, I really come from a musician's perspective and I, I, I don't, I didn't read African American after that. I started reading. She gave a biblio, but but realizing that we we sometimes are so focused on what we do that we don't realize that it affects other fields and and is related to other fields. And what I want to ask you is is, is kind of similar to what I asked Wolfram. Do African American writers today do they relate to jazz or are they into another music when they're writing? Um, yes and, and yes. Um, so Toni Morrison is still writing, uh, and she's still writing about jazz, as are other African-American writers, and as are writers that are not African-American. And there are Native American writers writing about jazz and blues, there are Jewish American writers writing, Philip Roth, um, uh, and many others. Um, and so jazz has stopped being only a symbol of african Americanness, but it is always still also a symbol of resistance, of subversiveness, of certain kinds of freedom, of certain kinds of challenges um, to, to uh, you know, to, to, to stat the status quo. Um, but within black literature, it's still some kind of symbol um, for the history of race. Today, you also have an emergence, so that's the yes, um, but the, the second yes, um, there's a new form in black American literature, which is called urban literature, ghetto literature, or hip-hop literature. And so you have a lot of writers um, who are turning to hip-hop. And you have the same divide that we heard before about popular music and elitist music within, within the literature. And so the ghetto, the ghetto literature, you know, it's, it's, it's usually, it's very popular, it's very racy. Uh, um, you know, sexually explicit, of, um, um, violently explicit, and so on, and so it appeals to a different uh, communal sensibility. Any questions from the audience? Yes, where from? Um, first of all, thank you. Um, I, especially for one sentence that you, you you spoke about the potential of literature and music to redefine the categories of race. And, uh, you know, basically that would be an answer to some of the, the things we discussed earlier. The potential of art to redefine the problems we are dealing with. So that is an ultimately political um, uh, thing that music, uh, that, we, that, that, that we can achieve with music or with literature. Or with and um, second 
and um, there I'm the, the musicologist and not the literary historian. Uh, probably a stupid question, why bebop? What is bebop in respect to these texts? A form, an inspiration, a metaphor, and for whom? For the author, for the reader, for the literary critic? Okay. Um. There's no simple answer to that to that to that question. Um, I'll say a few things, I, I suppose. Uh, the first is that this comes out of a larger project in which I assigned, um, hopefully not too arbitrarily, but um, I will confess maybe some um, uh, uh, ar so, some some of the work of the literary critic and not of the music musician, um, where I assign um, certain kinds of texts to certain musical. Um, periods uh, within within jazz, um, and the way I did that is by reflecting on the changes from each musical style to the next. So that, you know, so I was looking at um, blues, bebop, um, I can't remember now, swing, and um, free jazz, I think. Um, and uh, within each, I looked at, I think, also four different elements uh, to see the, the shift. So there was um, syncopation, improvisation, um, antiphony, and something else now. I can't remember. Swing, maybe. Um, and, and each one of these musical moments, so when you move from the blues to swing and from swing to bebop and from bebop to um, the avant-garde free jazz, um, we have different approaches to these elements, these fairly stable elements that are apparent in anything that we all more or less agree is jazz. Um, and what bebop does, you know, so if, to zoom into that, or, or the way I have understood what bebop does, because I'm not a musician, um, is to, first of all, it became a very intellectual form of, of musical um, expression. You, you, you needed to know music. If you could just pick up a guitar and start doing the blues, um, you couldn't do that with bebop. Um, you needed to know how the music works, um, and so there's a kind of an intellectual aspect to it. Um, the kind of, um, I used, uh, I, I looked at harmonies really as a metaphor for communal uh, interactions, different ways of, of having voices heard together. Um, so that becomes a very much a metaphor. Toni Morrison is explicit about being influenced by jazz and using jazz as a mechanism within her writing and the form of her writing, and we can see different ways in which she does that. Um, you don't need jazz to read the novel jazz. Um, but you might, if you do know jazz, you might recognize some things there. So it's a, kind of all, all of the above, I suppose. 